Charlton Singleton. I am the artist in residence emeritus here at the Gilliard Center. And welcome again to Raising the Volume. Today we have a special guest, as all of them are very special guests for us. But today we have Dr. William Melvin Brown. He's not in trouble, but I just like saying all his names. <laughs> so you know, my mother. Like, yeah, just like your mom. <laughs> yeah, which I'm gonna talk about. I'm gonna ask you about your mom okay. as well. And, okay. you know. Uh so welcome to the welcome to the Gilliard. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I love this perspective. Yeah, you know, isn't this nice? You know, <laughs> yeah. you see out like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is beautiful. Please. So now yeah. for uh the record. Um, you're born and raised here in Charleston? That's right. What part of, uh, of the Charleston area? Well, um, when I was born, I would say I, I was born uptown, but I've learned over the years that I was born in Wagner Terrace. I'm sorry, Hampton Park Terrace. Ah, it's yeah, It's got yeah. a fancy name now. Right, yeah, right, Historic right. West Side Charleston. Historic <laughs> West Side Charleston. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so now, uh, I know it is extremely different now. Yes, it is. From then, what would you say the m one of the most biggest differences of that area from when you were a little boy growing mm -hmm. up to now? Well, I think we've had a big swing um, in the, let's say, ethnic makeup of the neighborhood for sure. And um, you're also seeing an increase as far as people's earning um, capacity in that neighborhood. So it's funny, that neighborhood has swung now, I would say, the third time that neighborhood was built post-World War I primarily, and at that time I think it was primarily a Catholic Jewish neighborhood. Um, fast forward to about the 60s when they were building I-26, uh, there was a lot of flight from that neighborhood and it became a black neighborhood. And my parents were one of the homeowners in the neighborhood. So when I grew up it was primarily a, a blue collar, white collar, um, African American and black community. Um, Fast forward again, I came back to Charleston. I was in the military, and we'll get into that if you want to. Right, but, yeah. but I came back to Charleston in uh, 2000 to go to school, and I already started seeing what everyone knows is the big word, the G word, gentrification happening. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the older families I knew growing up were dying off or moving away. Um, kids were going off to different cities to find things. And so we had a younger, um, I said primarily white population moving in. Uh, I left again, came back in 2015, and it was pretty much uh, considered a really high-end neighborhood on the peninsula. Mm -hmm. So I've seen quite a bit of shifting in the time I've been coming back to Charleston. Right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, born in Charleston, raised in Charleston. Um, now, I always wanted to ask this question, and I've got a lot of people that... Yeah, let me um, hold on here. No, no. <laughs> I've got a lot of uh, friends and, and, um, and family that can give me this answer, but I'm thinking about it right now. So how do you say Porter God, Goud? <laughs> so it's Porter Goud, but everyone here says Porter Guard. Why is that? <laughs> I don't know. It, it's almost a mental block. People seem to struggle with that G-A-U-D part. Um, it's a German name, mm -hmm. and you're just getting back from Germanic country. Yeah. A-U is Au, okay. so it should be Porter Goud. But everyone struggles with that. There's a couple of Charleston words we could probably come across with. True, <laughs> true. There's a lot of there's a lot of words that people will look at and see that it's you know spelled this way, and you should say it. Yeah. You know, I was talking with somebody yeah. about, about that the other day about we've got a uh, not too far from here. Uh, H a s s e l. Oh yeah. L. Yeah. But Hazel. it's not ha but it's not Hassel Street. No, you're, you're selling Siri. <laughs> yeah, you're right, right. <laughs> Hazel Street, and then there's uh, Hugi. Yep, yep. H u g e r yep. Hugi. How do you say sausage? Sachez. <laughs> See, I say sachez. Exactly. Yeah, Another but one that's, of those that's, words. that's that's gulla. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or um, uh, in my neighborhood, we didn't say Theodore. We say Theodore. Theodore. Yeah, yeah. 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 I said that. For yeah. You. So um, educated here, of course. Um, yeah. um, where did you go off to college? So I went to the United States Naval Academy um, yeah. in 1987. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Lots of different reasons flowing through my mind at that time, but uh, the overriding <coughs> tenets were one: I was 17 when I graduated high school, and I wasn't so sure I was ready for school, and I needed kind of someone to kind of keep me in line. And I said, "Well, the military school should do that." And two, no idea what I really, really wanted to do. A lot of ideas of what I wanted to do when I grew up. I wasn't really sure what. 
I've always had an idea of doing different professions. And I was attracted by the fact that this military schools and co-op colleges kind of put you into position going out when you graduated. And I figured that buys me time to kind of sort out what I want to do right. in my life. So. Okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So those are the two big drivers for that. All right. Now yeah. put a pin in that really quick okay. because I wanted, to, I, I forgot sure. to jump and, and ask something before that. Sure. Sure. Um, now, um, I, I knew your mom, mm -hmm. um, being that you all are members of the church that I play at. Right. And I knew just how big of a figure your mother was in this community. Mm -hmm. um, can you just speak on some of the things that she was involved with and, yeah. and, and, and everything? Let, let, me, let me set the tone. Mm -hmm. um, my mother, you know. Well, uh, just born. your family in general, actually, <laughs> really. Yeah, but mom born in the early 40s. Um, she went to private school, too. Really? I didn't yes. know that. She went to the uh, Avery, um, the Avery Normal Institute. Yeah, your mom went to Avery. Yes, that's yes. big time. Over on Bull Street. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think when she graduated, her tuition was there. You know, her her dad had good money. Her tuition was forty five dollars a year. <laughs> that's good money. Babe. Yeah. Good money. Um, just to just kind of set the tone of who she was. She was a a great student at that point already, and had earned uh, a full scholarship to Talladega College. And the scholarship, however, was in dance, modern dance. What? Yes. Modern. I did not know yes, that. Okay. Yes. It pictures my mom looking very Alvin Ailey. Yeah. You know, in college. Um, and she was a pre-med major and got into medical school and was going to go to Fisk. But she took some time off to help her mother on and teach and met my dad at the faculty lounge. At the faculty <laughs> lounge. <laughs> And Hold up. Time out. Time <laughs> I out. I knew you were going to stop me the there. The faculty lounge. <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. The, the, you know where the name of that, Yeah, you know where the name of that comes from? No. Well, back in the day, uh, it, was, it was owned by Rudy Cochran. And back in the day, yeah, it, was really, a, yeah. it was a bar. And a lot of the teachers from Burke and C.A. Brown taught would go there. And, and it was a you know yeah. key club to kind of make That's sure right. that they didn't run into their students because there was no drinking age back Right, there. right. So they named it the faculty lounge. I did not yeah. know that part. Yeah, and my, my mom met my father there. She thought he was a little bo boisterous and boasty and <laughs> didn't care for him at all and <laughs> ran into him at work in her new job. And she's like, oh, that guy. <laughs> Long story short, she decided not to go to medical school and married him um, to marry him because mm -hmm. in those days that was a good decision point. Yeah. Um, and he made it his, um, you know, mission in life to make sure she didn't regret that. And, you know, he was very successful business wise. Yeah. But she taught chemistry and physics. Um, first African American teacher to teach that in the South Carolina public school system at St. Andrews High School, which was a predominantly white school. Mm -hmm. uh, when I say predominantly, I'm talking 95 percent. Right. And she just became quite a figure through education. Um, she met people like Anita Zucker, uh, Jim Clyburn. They mm -hmm. all taught together. Mm -hmm. Quite a class, right? That's right. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and just became this. And then when my father passed away too soon at age 60, she became this, this beacon for philanthropy. And so, yeah, she was quite a dynamic, beautiful chick that also passed on <laughs> my desire to serve my community, for mm -hmm. sure. Definitely. You know? Yeah. She was, so, uh, you're at the Naval Academy. And at that particular point, when you enter, you said you know, you didn't know exactly what it was you wanted to do. No, how, did, no. uh, how did you eventually become or get to medicine? Well, I always liked <laughs> sciences. Um, I was good in math. I didn't choose math, but I was good in math. But I've always loved the sciences. And like I said, mom taught physics and chemistry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. okay, I was predetermined. Right. Um, and um, I thought as a high, in high school, I said, oh, I want to be a doctor. Then I got to college and uh, I didn't, I had help with my father picking a major. And he said, well, engineers make a lot of money coming out of college. You should do engineering. I was like, done. <laughs> 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 well, engineering was not easy. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when I was getting my grades, weren't, which weren't as great as good as they were in high school, I was like, man, you go to med school, you're going to have a really high GPA. I don't really want to go to med school. <laughs> I just okay. want to get through this and yeah. go to the Navy and I'll figure it out. So um, I went to the Navy as an engineer and was on ships. And I really, uh, it's not a plug for the military, but there's no better way to spend age 21 to 26. It's being on a ship, 
learning how to be a manager and seeing the world mm -hmm. on the dime, on the government's dime. Yeah. Did a lot of growing. And after that experience, a I came. A lot of knowledge you can get through there. A lot of knowledge. Nothing like travel as far right. as education. Yeah. And at that point, I got to age 26, and I said, well, I don't want to stay this course because you're on the track to become a, a captain of a ship when you're on that track. I said, I don't want to do this for a living. Um, let me look back at the dream of being a physician. And I came back home and started working on that. Night school, getting better GPA grades, and mm -hmm. got myself into one medical school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank God. That's right. <laughs> and went to MUSC right here. That's yeah. what brought me back to Charleston for the first time. Uh, yeah. Around about what year was that? So this would have been 19... Well, I, I took an assignment in the Navy teaching at the Citadel in 1996. Okay. Um, the Citadel has Naval ROTC for the scholarship students there, and I was one of the advisors and teachers. And I took an assignment doing that because it allowed me to go to school at night on the Navy's dime in the Citadel grad school. So this was 1996, and I got a one-bedroom apartment on King Street <laughs> over mm -hmm. the former Kerrison's Jewelers. I what? Think it's, I think it's Lululemon now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, taught really during stayed. the day, went to night school at night, and then started med school in 98. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying to remember, I think, when I was playing at the church, and then uh -huh. I, and so, then I so left. I really got to know you, because you were growing up by then. Yeah, but then I <laughs> left, and when I came back, <clears throat> that's when I saw you in the choir. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then you went away. And we'll, we'll get back to that. But yeah. then you, you, you went away, and when you came back, Come back yeah. you know, ladies and gentlemen, I am still trying to get Dr. Brown to rejoin the choir. <laughs> it's a lovely tenor voice. <laughs> he has uh, thwarted me every time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, it's more than you. You were in the glee you know, club, I, I right? really miss it. I, was in the, I miss singing. I really miss it. Yeah? Yeah, it was a release for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I can tell you about my mom. It's in, uh, it's in my GNA. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So um, going to med school mm -hmm. and then after med school, um, I'm assuming that you are back assigned someplace else through the Navy, is it? Or Right. Um, so the Navy put me through medical school and I, my first assignment was in Virginia training for my specialty. And over the next few years, training in Virginia, um, and I was on a big ship with the Marines on it. Um, then I got stationed in Japan, then I got, w went to Afghanistan, went to Florida, went to Afghanistan again, and I said, that's enough, and I retired. <laughs> right. Uh -huh. <laughs> so it was quite an odyssey for sure. So mm -hmm. now, um, I mean, obviously, um, it's, a, it's a huge thing when you are going through school on the on the on the navy's dime yeah <laughs> you know um you know a lot of um a lot of people recommend that to find their their career mm -hmm. you know path and choice um how did you come to your specialty which is yeah. Yeah, emergency medicine emergency yeah. medicine yeah i gotta tell you man i'm i there, there's so many things i want to do in this life you mm -hmm. know i actually graduated with um a spot to be a pediatrician. Yeah. When I thought about the doctor that impacted me the most that made me think about going into it and it was my pediatrician. It's just the the kind way and and I just always felt comfortable and that's not a situation where kids are generally comfortable. Mm -hmm. But I, I thought if I could be that person to other people in the community, that's what I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. So I started out actually in pediatrics, did my internship training first year training in pediatrics at the Naval Hospital in Portsmouth. Um, but to be honest with you, by the end of the year, I felt like it was too focused. Um, I didn't want to just focus on that one population. Mm -hmm. And pediatrics is largely preventive medicine, which is very important, but it wasn't all I wanted to do. So luckily in the military, most people after their intern year have to go do a, a general practitioner tour mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. the Marines in the Navy, with the Marines or as a ship's doctor or a doctor for an aviation unit or a submarine unit. And I took that time I took a ship and I took that time to really reflect upon what is it that I want to do. So it was a combination of, at this point, Tar Charlton, I'm 34 years old. So being a neurosurgeon meant six more years of training. Whew. What is it that's going to satisfy what I want to do and not be, you know, gray and wizened by the time I'm finally done with the training? I came <coughs> up on emergency medicine because being out there with the fleet, uh, anything can happen on a ship. 
And a couple of things did happen, accidents, outbreaks of tropical diseases, and I really loved how different everything was. And I said, emergency medicine, you never know what's going to walk in the door. Mm -hmm. um, also, you don't take call in emergency medicine. <laughs> ah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> when you're there, yeah. you're there. Yeah, that's right. And it's intense. Yeah. When you're not there, you're, you're not there. You're not there. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So <laughs> I came scheduled. back and trained in emergency medicine. Yes. All right. Scheduled mayhem. <laughs> <laughs> scheduled mayhem. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I'd imagine, and, and I just don't know how these things, you know, work, mm -hmm. but it's got to be awesome to now come back and be doing what you're doing in your hometown. It's a dream. I always knew I was going to come back, Charles, because I've always loved Charleston. We all have our love-hate relationships and stories with Charleston, especially with the history here. Mm -hmm. um, dating back, you know, 400 years. Um, but I always felt, and perhaps this was opened up to me because my parents were so well-respected in the community because I went to Port of God. I always felt like this place had such potential to be so much more. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a bad place. It was just kind of, I don't want to say seated in history, but stuck in history. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be a part of it. At that point in my life, as far as a young adult, a late teen young adult, most uh, uh, African Americans couldn't wait to get out of Charleston, you know, present company included. I didn't want to go to school in the state. Um, and then when they graduate college, they don't come back because they feel that there's, they have a better shot professionally somewhere else. And a lot of cases in a lot of industries, that's true. If, you, if you're an African American and you're not a doctor or lawyer, it's really hard to kind of really climb that corporate ladder here, even as a doctor and lawyer in a lot of cases, you know. Um, but I always wanted to come back and be a part of the change. I wanted to come back and prove that a, a black person uh, could be come back here and be woven in the community like my father did, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And I guess part of that, too, is I saw it. I could see that in my father, and I wanted to come back and do that and kind of pick up where he left off and be entrenched in this community, you know, and, and, and be successful here. So I always knew that I wanted to come back and be a part of that change. And right. the city has changed for the good, I think. Mm -hmm. um, in your profession, mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, like uh, I was just in a conversation um, uh, not too long ago and someone was telling me about me being humble, mm -hmm. you know, because of the accomplishments you know, that, that I've, you yeah. know, worked hard for and everything. And you've like killed that. it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, um, but when you look up your name mm -hmm. and it starts to just start flashing all of these things with Google. God, yeah, Google, <laughs> you know, the almighty Google. Google is the is the electronic version of the whiz. Yes. You know? <laughs> yes. yes. The almighty whiz. Yeah. yeah <laughs> you know, but like uh, being, for example, like being on the board. Mm -hmm. You're on the board at A couple MUS. Boards. <laughs> A couple boards now, but yeah. The biggest one is uh, the Medical University of South Carolina. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's big time in it, bro. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Yeah, it, still it, can't believe it three years later. <laughs> but it, but it, I mean... Uh, I'm sure that you get uh, a lot of different calls and looks and, mm -hmm. you know, people to come and ask you, you know, thank you, you know, yeah. to speak and, and present and, and talk about uh, the way that you have, uh, have uh, been a physician to the way that you became a physician to, mm -hmm. you know, how you can improve on things at your hospital or, or you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. and, and so yeah. um, to do all of that um, in addition to... Um, you know, being able to help your community in any which mm -hmm. way you can, which is something that you do do. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, how has all of that been to, to get all of that attention like that? It's been nice. Um, when you've been in the Navy for 20 years and you rejoin a community, a lot of times you worry about lost time or missed time. Lost, not lost, missed time. Mm -hmm. So I came back at 44 saying to myself, okay, I said I was coming back, but I'm kind of coming back after missing over that 20 years, 15 years, 16 years of being in Charleston. So I hope I can get back in. I hope uh, I can, you know, go back to some of those connections. And thankfully, a lot of the people were, were welcoming me back with open arms. Mm -hmm. And I've been fortunate. I mean, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty 
pretty, I'm, I'm relatively young to have gotten that position on the board. I was 47 when that mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. And um, it is definitely a council of old men. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, the timing was right. The seat came open. I went, I, I went up to the assembly to meet some of our lawmakers and they thought I wasn't crazy, so they let me have the seat. <laughs> oh, no. I've always thought that you got to be a little crazy to be an emergency <laughs> physician, man. That's good crazy, I think. Yeah, that's good crazy, you know. Yeah, you know. And, it, and it's it's borne more fruit. Um, <coughs> I was, well, before that board, I, I had a little, some board experience um, at Port of God. I'm, I was our first on the board at Port of God, still there. Um, but it's borne some fruit too. That exposure, meeting people, lawmakers in the state, just the heavy hitters in Charleston, mm -hmm. um, gave me an opportunity to be on a small community bank board as well, which is one of the things my father, both my parents have passed away. One of the things my father said, if you ever get the opportunity to do this, serve on a bank board, learn how money works. Mm -hmm. And I got an opportunity to do that. So it's been a heck of a learning curve. Uh, the schedule is full, but it, right. I'm happy. I'm yeah. happy when I'm busy. For sure. Yeah, when you're right. busy. But I've seen yeah. you playing, too. <laughs> <laughs> Got to have balance. I'm yeah, a Libra. Yeah, it's a balance. I'm a Libra. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you know, so um, I, I, I got I to gotta ask you this. Mm -hmm. um, and this is actually um, the way that I found out uh, was really, really a little weird. Um, but I was actually in an airport, uh -huh. and um, we were waiting. Uh, we had like a two-hour layover or something, and we were looking for something to eat, you know. And you know they've got all of these bar restaurant sort of types of things. Right. And we went into this one place, and they had about three or four TVs. Mm -hmm. And I looked up on the TV, and they had CNN on there, and mm -hmm. I saw you on there, <laughs> and I was just like. Wait a minute. <laughs> That's the homie right there. <laughs> um, and they were talking about uh, the Charleston Rifle, Rifle Club. Club. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you want to get too much into it, in, but can you mm. just explain, you know, what happened? Yeah, you know, I'll give you, I'll or give the short story? The, the executive notes? summary? Yes. <laughs> um, well, I told you the neighborhood that where I live, you know, it was initially uh, Catholic and... Jewish neighborhood, Jewish. but it was, it was primarily a white neighborhood. And there were a couple of private clubs in the neighborhood, um, Jimmy, Gen Jimmy Dengates, The Ark, and The Rifle Club that were in the neighborhood. And they were known, when we were children, we knew those were all white clubs. And even though the neighborhood had switched to being a black neighborhood, those clubs remained, and they were still all white clubs. We couldn't go into those clubs, okay? Um, this particular one, the Rifle Club, uh, which used to be the German r club, then the German Rifle Club, funny because the German club was somewhere where the Germans could go and not be discriminated against in Charleston. Then it became the German Rifle Club and then the Rifle Club. Anyway, this particular club, which is right when you land off I-26 at the top of Mount Pleasant Street, that area, mm -hmm. on the water, nice little piece of property, kind of like an Elks Club type setup. Mm -hmm. it, it was opening up to the people who are moving into the neighborhood so like I said gentrification was happening you had you know more upper middle class moving into the neighborhood and they spotted this club and said hey let's go there and a lot of the folks I went to high school with a lot of the folks that I went to medical school with who lived in that area were members of this club you know it was inexpensive it was cheap food cheap drinks they all and they like they had bowling nights they were enjoying this club and they were telling me about it when I wasn't living here this is after medical school. I'm in the Navy. I'm in, I'm in Virginia. And they're telling me about it as I go to all these different places. So when I came back home, we're sitting there one night at the Rifle Club having some drinks. And, um, and uh, they said, why don't you join? And I said, don't you know about this club? And they're like, what? And I was like, there's no black people in this club. And they're like, oh, no, that's not true. And I said, look into it. And my friends were like, you're right. And they're like, why is that? And I said, you tell me. <laughs> And they said, well, that's probably not that way anymore. You should, you should apply to the club. And I said, ah, I don't know about that. A couple of drinks later, we're like, sure. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, we applied because they, they, were, they were telling me, you know, Charleston's not like that anymore. The city's different. You know, you know it's, it's three times the size of when you were here. You know, people don't think that way anymore. And it was almost like the, you know, the record scratch. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. They, and the ensuing days, um, it was all people were talking about the club. 
and my friends were a little taken aback. They're like, wow, this, mm -hmm. this still exists. I'm like, yeah, I told you. But I'm not one to quit. I said, we're going forward. Mm -hmm. And I talked to my friends. I said, this can get ugly. Mm -hmm. Are you in? They're like, yeah, the, we're, we believe this. I was like, okay, let's go forward. Um, so fast forward, I think it was two or three months after that application was my round. Every round, every month they vote. And no one ever, they, they were telling me, no one ever not, no one's ever not been voted in. I was like, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it comes up and um, there's about 16, 17 people that were up for membership that night. And we all had to stand up in front of the club and we had to give, speak a few words about ourselves. And I'm standing there, you know, there's this whole, we love our veterans sign behind, uh, behind me. Flags with, you know, uh, battle campaign pennants for all the battles that, you know, people in the club had participated in and talking about their mission for loving the veterans. Um, and uh, I don't want to sound like a jerk, but it was clear that my resume was stood apart from the group. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, and I was the only person that didn't get voted in. Mm. So that was what happened there. Um, the people that were up there with me up for membership, you, sh you should see the shock in their faces when I didn't come back in as a person who had been voted in. I think they didn't realize, because there were people that had moved around in from other towns, and I don't think they realized what they were in for. Right. You know? They um, ain't from you. They're not from you. They ain't, they ain't from, from you. Yeah. So um, they said, you know, we were all standing outside where they were voting, and they invited everyone back in, and they stopped me. They said, listen, you didn't get voted in, but you're welcome to come back in. And I was like, no thanks. So I went home. And my friends came running out after me, and they're like, what happened? Blah, blah, blah. So that happened, and I, and, I, and, I, and I didn't talk to anyone about it. I didn't go to the papers. I was just like, I told, I told my friends, it's like, see, mm -hmm. we, we still have work to do. Mm -hmm. So I went and had a drink with Dwayne a couple ah, of weeks yeah. later. Mm -hmm. um, and he said, you should tell that story to the news. I said, I'm not looking for press for woe is me type story. <coughs> and he said... No, 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 the story's bigger than woe is you. And he said that, uh, you know, Dwayne was, went to Princeton, went to Iowa Law. He was one of the, he was the, I think he was the first black lawyer to major firm on Broad Street. Dwayne Green. Dwayne Green. Dwayne, okay, Dwayne who's Green. probably been on your show, I'm not sure. He has not. <laughs> okay. But, um, but that's an thank idea. You. <laughs> thank you. Um, he was the first um, lawyer. He was given an opportunity to work at B. S'more Smythe McGee. And on Broad Street, and he said it was a great opportunity. He loved, loved working at the firm. Um, he was able to get a great case and kind of split off on his own. He said, but one thing that he saw, and not just that firm, but all the firms in Broad Street that was, that was consistent, he said, is um, minority or female young associates struggled to get in on big cases or to, to get mentors because they weren't at the social club they weren't at the hunting club they weren't members of the golf club mm -hmm. and i don't want to call it any names in any particular right. clubs okay but he said you know and as anyone knows a lot of business happens outside the mm -hmm. office mm -hmm. and he said a lot of people who weren't in those clubs were not getting those business opportunities or getting lifted up and he said so he says don't think of it as like this is a place you and your friends wanted to go and have cheap beer he says this was a social club that you were denied access to which could be a ticket to a better life for a lot of people. And it's very important in the continuum of what we're trying to accomplish with diversity, equity, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. And Dwayne, who I've always been thought, you know, that's my friend who tells terrible jokes, really <laughs> got serious and broke it down. <laughs> and I was like, you're right, this is important. And I'm wrapping this up. Yeah, I told yeah, the story yeah. to um, Adam uh, Parker at the Post, Post Courier. Courier. And... Um, he said, this is an amazing story. He's like, there's so many things that are at work here. And he put the story out, and the New York Times picked, up, picked it up, because, you mm -hmm. know, the New York Times has a love affair with Charleston. And that got picked up, and then Don Lemon called. Mm -hmm. and I, was, I was leaving the hospital, and like, can you be here in an hour? <laughs> and, yeah, and Mount Pleasant? And, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, okay. And the whole thing just expanded. But a lot of good has come out of that i mean mm -hmm. it opened a conversation definitely you know you know I'm, I'm of the thinking you can't walk around being angry at people for not understanding your plight part of that you have to meet people halfway and tell them well this is the plight and i'm not wanting you to say you apologize or you're sorry i just want you to know the stories and be aware and that was a catapult into a conversation for me in this town and 
the way I handled it and presented, it bore more fruit because they're speaking engagements. Again, the, the, the bank board offer, they, mm -hmm. they thought this is a person who's very thoughtful. We went on our team right. to kind of help us along this thing. Right. Just, it can, and this is the last thing. I got a reputation for being able to meet people where they are yeah. on this issue. And mm -hmm. that's worked out well for me. Definitely. Yeah. So that was so, a little long. Sorry. No, that's, that was perfect. <laughs> that was perfect. So mm -hmm. meeting people where they are. Mm -hmm. Choir rehearsal hmm. is on Thursdays. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> My son goes. That's right. He does. He does. He does. He does. You know. Charlton, I'm going to shock you one day. <laughs> it, you know, I, I work two weekends a month, so. Just, I'm, show, I'm, just, <laughs> just gonna... roll up in the choir. You know, you don't have to come to practice. Don't tell everybody else I said that. Yes. Just roll up in the choir. Yeah, cut that and, out. <laughs> and, you know, come and sit down on the front like you used to sit right there on the front of the, you know, in the choir loft and just belt it out. Or uh, what if what if you cantered one day? That I would love that. If I send you it long in advance, would you canter? Yes. So you if, canter if I had the Sunday and, you're, off. And, you're, and you're and your daughter is serving that day, right? <laughs> family affair. It could be a family affair. A whole family affair. <laughs> uh, um, last thing. Um, uh -huh. Are there any other uh, community initiatives or anything that you are involved in that? Uh, hmm. That you want to, you know, speak on or? Gosh, um, I know you do a lot, so that's putting you on a spot. Yeah, there's, there's a lot. There's a lot going <laughs> on, <laughs> for sure. Um, there's there's two things I would like to put a plug in. Um, I am not involved in this as I would like to either case, either project as I would like to be involved in, but I really believe in them. Um, there's a there's a young fellow named Troy McLean, and when I say young, I think he's maybe 30 now. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and he's doing a thing. All the event's called Brothers and Blazers, but it's a, it's a, it's under a bigger umbrella. And he is really doing mentoring on a level that I want to be more involved in. But right now, I've just really just been able to be a supporter from distance. Mm -hmm. And uh, he brings these um, young African American boys, and we're talking, you know, preteens, early teens, into the setting of the Harbor Club um, on, at West Edge, and invites them to a, a banquet, a luncheon, in which they, have, you know, they have to wear blazers, they yeah. dress up, they have to look professional, and he matches them up with some black leader in the community, another male. Um, and I really love what he's doing there. And uh, he does these things uh, at least quarterly. And what he's doing is he's really putting the first block in how do we level this playing field in that he's showing these young black men who, for different reasons may not get to see another black man in that role together with someone to start conversations. I'm a big man and I believe in conversations is how we're going to mm -hmm. solve all the ills of the world is if we can get people to sit down and talk. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to do a plug for Troy McLean and Brothers and Blazers. Um, and the other thing too is um, my friend Kimberlyn is raising money for the Emmanuel Nine Foundation, mm -hmm. this monument. Um, this project is going to be amazing. Um, it's going to be this great green space down on Calhoun Street, um, and we're trying to see if that can be a different name, but that's yeah, another project. That's a whole but, <laughs> thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but um, it's an architectural beauty from the drawings, and it's going to be a beautiful green space, and it's going to be a, a stop on this freedom pathway that we're working on. <coughs> we are community. We are my state senator, uh, Marlon Kimson, which yep. is going to be anchored by the um, International African American Museum. So. Um, those are two projects that I'm distantly involved with and want to get more involved with. Um, I think more corporations need to know about this this, uh, this uh, Emmanuel 9 uh, park and monument being built because I think they all need to donate and be seen and be a part of it. And, you know, that, let that be the first cog in you opening up your mind to how I can be of assistance in this in, 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 in healing, so to speak. Right. But, that's two plugs. Yeah. <laughs> and I appreciate works. you giving me a chance to yeah, do that. Yeah, man. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Well, bro, I thank you, man. Uh, mm -hmm. I know that you're a busy guy. <laughs> and uh, I was just yeah. very uh, ecstatic when you answered right away and said, you know, you know, let me know when and, and I'll make sure I get it on the well, schedule. You. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Charles and I, calls and I, you to respond. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I kid you about the choir. <laughs> uh, okay, no, I, I don't no, care. I'm going to surprise you one day. I'm going to surprise you one day. I need you to come back <coughs> on the choir. I mean, th this guy, uh, <laughs> we called him on a dime for my retirement from the Navy after 20 years. We called him on a dime and said, could he come and, and do taps for my retirement ceremony? 
without hesitation, world-renowned, you know, musician comes to my my event. I appreciate that. Yeah, y'all promised me sweet tea. So I'll get, <laughs> <laughs> so I'll get there. <laughs> No, but that was funny. a beautiful ceremony. <laughs> Thank you for you know asking me to be a part of that. That was a Thank really you. nice ceremony, and congrats oh, yeah. on you know just that your naval yeah. career and everything, man. I'm a big fan, man. Likewise, <laughs> likewise, likewise. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you all for uh, tuning in, and um, we thank uh, Dr. Brown for uh, all that he's doing, and um, we'll see you on the next one. Thank you. <laughs>